Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology and offer proven ways to put the five moments of need into practice. Welcome back, friends, to another Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosher here, one of your co-hosts of the many series that we've done. We want to thank you so much. We're well into our late 50 episodes, which we're so honored to be a part of and so appreciate your subscriptions to that. By all means, please let us know how we're doing. As always, topics, ideas, challenges, anything we can do to make your journey towards the five moments and workflow learning better. I'm honored today to be joined by one of my dearest friends and the actual founder of the five moments of need through his brilliant work throughout his career, Dr. Khan Gottfriedson. Welcome, Khan. Thanks, Bob. As always, it's great to be with you. <laughs> well, it's always wonderful to have these chats, my friend. And this one's yeah. an interesting one because this it one is. actually came, friends, from a LinkedIn post. Those of you who follow that and, and listen to Connor or I are on those. We had one recently that had well over 10,000 views, over 100 reactions, as they call them, a bunch of comments. And it was from a situation that Con and I were a part of during a dear friend of ours work in this field. And we were listening in on a conversation. And in that conversation, she was asked a number of questions. And one of them from a, a very astute colleague was, so when would you not use performance support slash workflow learning? And I couldn't help Con, but to have walked away from that engagement intrigued. And for me, and obviously want you to jump in here, what I was taken back by the fact the question was even asked. I think I would have asked, give me a time when you think training should not be used. I can't imagine a time in our work and this shift from training to performance that we've been on for years, that we would not use workflow learning or performance support. You wanna speak a little bit to that in your journey as well? Well, performance support lands in the world of work, right? Mm -hmm. It's supporting people in the world of work. So if our objective, if our purpose, if our intent is to ensure that people work effectively on the job, why wouldn't you always have that? helping people do the work that they need to do. You know, the, the journey from learning requires people to move and to translate somehow what they learned into the workflow and then to apply it in the workflow in an ever-changing environment. So there isn't ever a time where you don't need that to happen, where the whatever it is that I've learned needs assistance in making that journey to the workflow transfer and then sustaining it in the workflow over time. And so I can't imagine ignoring that important journey. And, and then sometimes I just need to work, you know, <laughs> in the flow of work and learn as I do. Yep. You know, it, it's an important pivot. It's one that I learned through you. It's one that many of our experts who join us in Experience Matters, one of our another podcast series, share over and over and over again. One of our dear friends, Doug Holt, who's one of our featured podcasts early on, said, you know, once you've seen this, you can't go back, right? And, and that's been our journey from a training first mindset. Let's build three versions of this or nine days of that or 70 learnings on this or nine virtual sessions on blah, 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 to one where we pivot more on the workflow and performance and build first for the workflow. And then if we have to, maybe not at all, but if we have to, then we, we build training, which is a complete 180 from the way I know I was schooled, frankly, and spent the first 20 years of my career designing it from. So Con, in this particular post, I list seven deliverables or seven outcomes that we have found from our work over the years in this area. And it has happened time and time again. These are not just happenstance or a one-off. These are repeatedly things that happen. And we're going to go through those seven today a bit deeper. And I think, as you said a moment ago, Khan, I think these, at least I know for me, are the seven reasons that I got into this profession in the first place. And it was not to get fives on an evaluation or to be an order taker, if I may be so bold, around whatever training deliverable those that I serve want to have. And the first point was this issue of time to competence. You were speaking about that a minute ago. We, in a past podcast, talked about train, transfer, sustain. That's the infamous journey we've used time and time to really explain 
and even visualize that journey from that learning you mentioned to application. So what about this time to competency being reduced by half? What does that mean and sort of where does that come from? Well, when you step into the workflow and you have two clicks, 10 seconds access to just what you need at the moment of need to do your work, you're immediately empowered with the ability to perform, right? Mm. You don't have to wait. From the moment you step into the workflow, you can begin to apply what it is that you've learned in your training. And so this ability from moment one to be performing in an ever-changing environment and adapting and adjusting, it moves you rapidly to that competency. Whereas if I don't have that, if I don't have that bridge and that support, then I've got to find my way. I've got to figure through trial and error, which we hear a lot of (laughs) these days, of figuring it out. And frankly, that's inefficient. That's not an effective way to do it. And so with a digital coach or an EPSS, that, that performance support system in place, then I'm performing the moment I step into the flow of work. And if I have a gap, a performance gap, I close my own performance gap. I know what it is that I need to do. I don't know how to do it, but two clicks, 10 seconds, I get to everything that I need to close that gap. And so I'm constantly closing my performance gaps as it relates to my own competency. Yep. And therefore I get to that much faster. You know, what's funny, Con, this challenge is a sacred cow, if you will, in our industry. And that is that we often associate performance or the success of our training classes with memorization. The degree to which somebody can regurgitate back what they learned through a test or exam or demonstration. And the reality is it's about performing. You know, there's, there, I don't know if this has actually ever been validated, but there's a classic Einstein, Einstein quote about, you know, I never learned my phone number because I could look it up. Yeah. You know, but the point here is if the journey is truly performance, sometimes, in fact, a lot, we can guide a learner to doing before they ever really even internalize it. Oh, yeah. Before they even memorize it, before they even quote unquote learn it. Now they will over time and and that dependency on a digital coach drops off, if not immediately, but over time. But if I can continue to look up something that changes all the time, for instance, but I principally know what it is I have to do, why can't I never memorize the six steps to do it when I could look them up and do them correctly and quickly every time? That's the time to competency that the world judges them by, not our traditional time to competency that L&D might, which is by going through the course proving you memorized, being able to, you know, go through what you did. That's really kind of a unique way of looking at something our industry's looked at very differently, I think, for a long time. It, it really is, Bob. I distinguish the difference between time to effective performance. That's different than the time to competency. Mm. And when you have performance support in place, the time to effective performance is immediate. Right. I, I can perform effectively. And as I perform effectively over time in an ever-changing environment, I learn. When things go wrong, I solve it. When things change, I close that gap and figure that out. In all of that, I begin to integrate the various skills together into larger skill sets and capabilities. And that is where competency is born as I integrate all of these effective performance of my job tasks with the knowledge and experience that comes from doing it and doing the things that we need to do in the flow of work. Number two, same as competency, time to competency, reducing the footprint I have. This is one of the greatest gifts that I think in your work, among many, that I as a designer most learned from. And that's this wonderful thing. Again, we've done these in past podcasts, but we're kind of boiling it up here in this one is this idea about something called critical skills. We do not have to train people as long as we have a digital coach on everything, right? If we enable them in the workflow to learn things that don't kill them, hurt others, or get them in trouble, significant trouble, you know, the world of learning while doing is been proven theoretically way more effective than pulling you out of that and training you. So this idea that through critical skills, and the use of workflow learning, we're able to use what we call targeted learning versus something our industry called for years, blended learning. What to you, Khan, is the difference between those two things enabling the second point? Well, consistently over all these years, probably the last 20 years, 
we've been looking at all of the job tasks that people need to perform and assessing the critical impact of failure and finding that on the average about half of them can be safely pushed into the flow of work for people to learn as they actually do their work, you know, in the context of work, which is much faster to translate to my job, right? That's just so important. We reduce that time that it takes that we have people stop their work to learn. We can cut that in half and address with greater significance the instruction that we give for those high risk skills. And then at the same time, be able to push those skills where the risk of failure isn't significant. If I fail, I can learn from it, you know, into the flow of work to guide me and to be guided as I do it. Brilliant. Number three, self-efficacy. Self-confidence. This is one of my personal favorites mm -hmm. about what the learner gains. I had a dear friend of mine years ago when I was training at Kodak. You know, one of the things that they brought up was this idea that, you know, we create a passive learner here at Kodak, even though we are a wonderful organization. And by the way, we didn't do it maliciously, but the person meant by that was we have this rigorous training schedule when the next stuff comes out. And what we taught that enterprise, and it's not unique to Kodak, I think we've done it all over the world, is we taught them to wait for us to let them have what they needed, all right? And so besides creating that delayed journey from knowing to doing, we also created a very passive learner who was kind of being told, you don't have the wherewithal to do this on your own. You got to wait till the next version comes out from some expert standing in front of you. And what I love about enabling people in the workflow con is that it raises their self-confidence in learning while doing. We've seen this across our clients time and time again. And we saw it in some remarkable things during the pandemic. Mark Wagner is one of our speakers from the Hartford, and he tells this miraculous story of an entire division of that organization having the self-efficacy and confidence because they had this remarkable digital coach called the KMT that they had learned and built the self-confidence in that they could continue their transfer and sustained journey on their own. And when asked to jump to a whole new discipline because of the pivot of COVID, entire, an entire business line was allowed, able to do it as opposed to wait till we write the course, let's put you all through a boot camp. Let's put weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of getting people up to speed and probably to the point we made a moment ago, not competent, but at least we would have gotten through the class. I mean, we see this time and time again as one of the most powerful parts, I think, from the learner's perspective of what not just a digital coach, but a performance mindset with multiple digital coaches as part of your deliverables can do yeah. for folks. You know, nothing increases confidence as much as successful performance, right? Right. right. And the ability to recover quickly when you make a mistake. Both That's of those a big one. are very powerful. And so if you have a performance support system in place that ensures that I am successful the moment I step in to do my work, that I succeed and I can see that success, self-efficacy is increased. If I make a mistake, I can recover quickly and rapidly. Again, my confidence increases. And we know from research as confidence increases, then my work performance actually accelerates uh, and I'm more engaged in my work. Yep. This is such an important piece to ensure that we minimize the failure that can occur once a person leaves a formal training environment and steps into their real world of work. If we can help them immediately be able to perform effectively, we've got increased confidence that will accelerate on and on in performance. Well, I think, well, four feeds three, right? That yeah. was three. Four is this idea about the insane rate of change. Everything's additive in this list. If I am self-confident, if I have been taught to use a digital coach, if I've reduced the training to just critical, so I manage cognitive load, and let people learn on the job. COVID has accelerated the rate of change in the workflow, like probably never in the modern era. And even before COVID, there was tons of research to support that the rate had far surpassed our ability to keep up with it in training. So helping our learners have the ability to keep up with change as it happens versus wait for the upgrade class or the lunch and learn or the boot camp, so that I can get there. This is a remarkable strategy to do and complement to that. Yeah, and frankly, when we do things over and over again, they become deeply rooted in our experience base. And 
oftentimes they become automated. And when you have to unlearn something that's become automated, you can't train your way through that. Organizations just simply can't invest in training to the extent that you can override deeply ingrained or deeply rooted skill sets that have occurred because I've been doing something in a certain way over time. And that's where performance support bridges that. It helps me as I, at that moment where I need to do it a new way rather than fall back on the old way, I need support in the flow of work to help guide me through that new way of doing things until I've unlearned and relearned a new way of doing something. And a lunch and learn will never do it. A training session will never do it. You've got to have a performance support system in place to accommodate that kind of change. Number five, I'll let you run up this one alone. This is your favorite thing, <laughs> measurement. We have been chasing ROI in L&D since the day I joined it over 30 years ago. Yeah. Why is this approach so different in the measurability of our work? When you have a performance support system in place, in the workplace, guiding people as they do their work, you have the ability then to observe that work. You know, the system is there guiding me as I work. And so therefore, I can understand and see and gather data about that work that we've never been able to do from the vantage point of a class. Uh, Gloria Geary saw this in the 90s. She recognized the fact that when you embed a tool in the workflow to guide people to help them do their work, then you have the ability to gather data at the same time about that work, which allows us to measure work performance in ways that we haven't been able to from the distance of a classroom. Brilliant. So I love this thing called RWA. It's rapid workflow analysis is the first step in the journey of many steps to get to a deliverable. One thing we shared in a recent alumni call with our alumni from our class was that one of the insights gained from this process that it, it really is, it, to us, it's just a step in the journey, but to many organizations in and of itself could be transformational alone. And that is that when you design for the workflow, you make the workflow, and I mean the real workflow, transparent. We help organizations see what's done by their workers, by their performers in the flow of work every day. Why has that been so different, Con, than in the past organizations say, well, I've done process analysis. I've even done workflow analysis. How, how is this different than how organizations may dismiss this topic and say, well, no, nah, we, 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 we've, we've got that already? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the process analysis ends at a high level. It stops uh, before it gets to the tactical level of doing work. And we have to manage work at the job task level. And so we map the workflow so that we can know tactically what it is that people need to do so that we can lift the burden of that tactical work off the shoulders of the performers so that they can focus on higher order thinking and the decision making, the other kinds of things that are so important in the workplace. So I don't know how an organization can ever expect to manage performance if they don't know what that performance mm -hmm. is. And unless we're at the tactical level, we'll never be able to uh, manage performance in the way that it needs to be done in the workflow. You know, and understand the criticality of that work. You bet. You know, when you layer critical skills analysis on top of an RWA, rapid workflow, th those two things together are in and of themselves before, if or when we build anything from L&D. We've had organizations we work with thank us for that. We've had stakeholders in the room um, observing, thank us for the fact that it's the, one of the first times they've ever really known the true work of their organization and what happens in the workflow every single day. Now, my friend, content management. Ah, it's back. <laughs> Knowledge management, it's back. Well, why? Because we're doing a lot of it now. We are at a content revolution in the world right now, again, with COVID coming out of this world of, of new workflows and changes by the second and information overload and so on, right? This idea about two clicks, 10 seconds access to things um, is one thing. That's the design, something we call the performance support pyramid. 
But the architecture of that pyramid is also a remarkably powerful activity for an L&D to lead an organization through because assets have always been there and there's always been a lot and they've always been redundant and they've always been out of date and they're always hard to keep current. All these things we hear from the days that SharePoint and even before came along. Why does this discipline bring rigor to that when we guide organizations through to that design of the solution? Well, different assets have different roles to play, don't they? And Mm. depending upon who I am, I need assets to help me in my journey. And some are uh, more helpful than others, and some are more expensive than others. And so orchestrating assets in an intentional way that ensures that I can perform effectively on the job is vital. It's a vital thing for us to do. And just uh, giving me a list of assets without orchestrating them in a way that helps me determine which assets do I need at this moment to help me and what I need to do. That's so important, you know, to have that guidance and that help. And so I might call a friend, but calling a friend can be a very expensive proposition and doesn't scale very well. Right. So Gloria Geary always taught that people assets need to be managed carefully and ought to be the last place that you go, that we ought to have other assets that we get to first. And so they're the assets that support me as I actually do my work versus learning assets that support me if I need to learn in the flow of work. Those different types of assets need to be orchestrated in what we call the performance support pyramid. And at the job task level, so that if I two clicks, 10 seconds land on the steps of a a specific task, all the resources that I need for that task in an orchestrated orderly manner are there for me to choose from based upon what it is that I need to be able to do with that task. You know, and let's not forget the ongoing maintenance of those things. Oh, yeah. The idea of governance, a word that was unfamiliar to me, to be honest, in the first 20 years of my work, right? This idea, once we start sharing the maintenance and the creation, in some cases, of those assets you described, Con, we've got to get our hands around user-generated content, another thing we've thrown out in our business forever, you know, but really never had a discipline or a way to get our arms around the reality of that. And we see that all the time in this work. Yeah. And, and all assets aren't, uh, aren't as helpful, right? And so yeah. we can learn from the usage patterns of our performers, which assets have value more than others, all of which can be helpful. So the last point, number seven, we'll wrap this up with is this idea. You know, we recently again did an alumni briefing with the folks from our courses and this brilliant man, Jeremy Smith, who we've admired for years, has been a remarkable practitioner uh, in this space, shared this idea that he journeyed into this because among other things, his L&D team had been minimized. They had become order takers, that those two dreaded words that we hear all the time about us. When, we be, when we've moved out of the performance zone and seen as those that support that and KPIs and other things we've talked about throughout this podcast and have been seen as those people who downstream put a bow around things by making training. And what we've seen time and time again, Con, that when you shift from a training to a performance mindset and a deliverable, your involvement in the conversation, the things that you build are seen way more strategic to organizations in the outcome and effectiveness of the performers than any deliverable in my lifetime we've ever built before. So this idea of becoming strategic, we've been wanting a seat at the table for years. I've heard that said from podiums and conferences for 20 years. But the journey to getting there and earning it is another matter. And not until I made the pivot to performance first and the five moments and the performance mindset I was not allowing myself, let alone the enterprise, to see me in that way. How have you seen this with organizations over your years? Well, you know, frontline managers have always been reluctant to give their people time to take an e-learning course or whatever. They're held accountable for the work that's getting done. So when you step in with a solution that lets them learn while they actually do their work, that supports them and ensures that they work effectively and efficiently, that removes waste, wasted time from that work and helps them focus and get things done. 
it's all about getting the work done and getting it done right and the productivity of their people. And you readily earn the respect of frontline managers. And that then rolls up to key stakeholders who then all of a sudden see this support and this performance happening. And we're talking about ensuring that their people perform effectively in their work. That kind of conversation is a conversation that is appreciated by the business. It takes us out of the realm of, let's talk about learning and having your people stop their work to learn to how do we help you enable your people to do the things that you need them to do. Very different. Everything we talked about has led to that final bullet. Well, friend, thank you so much as always for your insights. We appreciate that. We'll be back again. And by the way, friends, we will be doing a webinar on this very topic. So if you're interested in going deeper in this, if you want to discuss this any further, if you want to share your examples and lessons learned, we would love you to join us in a webinar downstream that we'll be sending out some information about posting on LinkedIn and otherwise, so that you'll be able to join us in that conversation about taking this deeper. Khan, thanks as always, my friend. So appreciate your insights and all that you do. Thanks, Bob. Be well, friends. Take care. Well, that's it for this episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the five moments of need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle at BMOSH, as well as our Five Moments of Need website, which is www.5momentsofneed.com. We hope you're finding these helpful and will subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.